Welcome to Holtz Academy's Rhino and Matrix tutorial. In this tutorial, I'll be showing some of the features and functionality we can see within Rhino and Matrix CAD software, and we talk about on the short courses and diplomas here at Holtz Academy. For today's tutorial, this will be the second in the series of tutorials I've come up with for showing how to use matrix techniques in Rhino, or in other words, how to actually emulate Matrix's builder menu and various automated tools in Rhino with equivalent surfacing to commands. For this tutorial, I'm going to cover how to use the gem on surface command and how to make gem cutters and uh, pave prongs on the surface of, in this case, a Bombay ring. Now for the placement of stones on a surface as well as the back holes and the pave prongs, I could just as easily use any shape of object I wanted to. I used a uh, Bombay ring here just for simplicity and also because it's a nice hollow surface where you can see the back holes come through underneath. Okay, the process in matrix would be to use the gem command, gem on surface. And what this does is it allows you to take the surface and put it in. And then you can actually see how the stones are going to sit on the surface. I can size manually with the Q and E buttons, the size of the stone on the fly as I place them. So I can press Q each time to bring it down in size, and I can press E each time to bring it up in size. And so at any point, I can freely place stones. Once the stone's in place, I can uh, use the red, green, and blue lines to give me a bit of a proximity alarm as to how close the stones are to each other. This allows me to work freeform pave. It's a very handy and very powerful tool, worth definitely worth the price of admission here to Matrix. Uh, I normally turn off the object snap because it tends to get in the way of actually using this command, but you could potentially leave it on if you needed to. And to finish it, you simply press enter. Once you have the stones, we could then make claws between the stones. There's automated commands such as the pave prong builder, which will automatically detect the distance between the claws, well, between the stones and where to place the claws. Or we could do it manually with the uh, prong on surface, which is what I'm going to show you now. Prong on surface works exactly the same way as a gem on surface. We put the surface in, and then we can place this, the claws. If the claws upside down, I can simply hit flip. And just like before, I can set the size and dimension of the claws in a similar way to the way I did it with the gem on surface. Prong diameter can be controlled with Q and E, or I can even use these sliders here to actually adjust the height to make it something more reasonable. And I just place the claws in between the stones as such. So the prospect of doing this is actually probably relatively straightforward. And then once we have our claws in place here, I'll add just enough to make it look believable. And then I'll press enter to keep. And then I have my stones and my claws on surface, but there's no seats for the stones yet. For the seats, I'll use a command in matrix called gem cutters. This is another builder based upon giving it stones. And it actually, even if I select other objects, it will just ignore everything but the stones. It allows me to do drill cutters which can then be lowered into the surface. As you see, this is very dynamic stuff, very easily controlled, very quickly modified. And this is one of the reasons why people like Matrix so much for doing fine jewelry. Then to finish this, we simply press enter, and we have our cutters ready for a Boolean difference. If I wanted to, I could simply just do that Boolean difference now, in the solid menu, Boolean difference. Target comes first, press enter, minus cutters, and then press enter. Make sure delete input is set to yes, and then press enter when done. And the result will be back holes for every stone, as well as stone seats. If I turn off the gems, you can see them. Now to do the same sequence we just did in Matrix and Rhino, getting gems on the surface, then getting the gem cutters, as well as the claws, we could uh, do it in, in Rhino as well, but it's going to be a very different process. 
Uh, there are commands to actually get objects on a surface, but they require a little bit of setup and discipline in order to use. To start with, I'm going to hide the ring, and I'm going to actually set up a stone in the looking down view through finger view of the shape I'm uh, planning to place on the surface, in this case a round pave stone. So to start with, I'm going to make sure that my grid snap settings are set to uh, 0.5 mil. That's fine. Or even potentially better, you could even do it as 0.25. That might help some here. It's going to be working quite small. Now I'm going to set up a polyline for the shape of the stone. Now, in this case, I'm going to try and I'm trying to make the stone so that it's going to be one and a half millimeters diameter. And you could make a stone that, that's larger and scale it down, that would work. Or I could just use a smaller grid snap. So 0.75 is the size of my stone in either direction. So that's three quarters of a millimeter. That'll be the shape here. If you're wondering why all my layers are looking like this, by the way, it's because this is what layers look like if you open a matrix file in Rhino. It doesn't actually make any difference towards your setup. I could conceivably make all these layers, color them, and name them accordingly. So it doesn't terribly matter much. Okay, so that's the shape of my uh, stone here. And I'm going to revolve that. Side here. I revolve this, the full circle. That's going to give me a nice small stone. Now I want that stone ultimately to sit so that the girdle is sitting straight on the ground plane. That's going to be important for the next step of the process when we actually get this on a surface. But I'm not quite finished yet. So I have the stone. The next thing I want to do actually is I want to make not just a stone but also a stone cutter. So I'm going to make on a different layer. I can just do it on orange just to match matrix here. And I'm going to make a shape that's actually mirroring the stone in many ways. Project will be helpful here, as will the various like end snaps and mid snaps. So I'm going to trace the edge of the stone here. And then when I get to the bottom part of the stone, halfway down, I'm going to hold down shift to keep it straight. And I'm going to give a nice significant distance here of maybe three or four mil before I bring it in. So that's the shape, as you can see in the through finger view, of the cutter itself. I have overshot the mark a little bit, and that's very much intentional. This means that even if the stone sits at a funny angle on the surface, it will still cut. You'll also notice I've given that my cutter a bit of a handle as well. That's going to make life easier for selecting these objects for Boolean difference later. So we take the shape, and just like with the stone, we revolve it, making sure I'm on a different layer from the stone. That's going to be important later on, as you'll see. Yeah, you want to keep your stone and your cutters on different layers as much as possible. Now it's going to be revolved the same way it was before, so it's going to be full circle. And that works fine. Okay, so that's given me a stone and a stone cutter. So we have a way of making the back hole in the stone seat. Now, one more thing I'm going to do here, this is going to be a bit odd at first, is on a yet another layer, and it doesn't terribly matter which one here. I'll do it on blue. I'm going to make a circle that's a quarter millimeter bigger than the stone in every direction. So if the stone's one and a half, this is going to be one and a half plus 0.25 plus 2.25, or in other words, two mil. This is going to be my replacement for the proximity alarm in the gem on curve. This will tell me if my stones are getting too close. So in effect, I'm taking all three of these objects at once when I place my object on the surface. Now we have our objects here. I can bring back my ring. And what I'm now going to do with the help of turning off the object snaps is I'm going to actually select all these pieces and I'm going to use a new command called orient on surface. You find it in the transform menu and it looks like a blue object, a blue box being laid on a surface. What this allows me to do is it allows me to set two points, one at the center and one at the edge here, and use that as the determining points of how the object sits on the surface. I'll show you what I mean. So I'll use Orient on Surface here. I've already have the object selected, or if I didn't have the object selected, it would ask me for them. And because I've turned off my object snaps that I've left on my grid snap, I have an easy time getting the points where I need them to be without accidentally grabbing the ring. So I wrap one point in the middle, and you see in every single view, it's going to be at the center of the universe. That's going to be helpful. 
That's my base point. And then my reference point is going to be on the edge of the stone. Again, it's for scaling and rotation is the reason why we have this. Now we select the surface we want to orient on, which is this piece here. You want to be careful you don't grab the inside of the ring, by the way. Now I'll leave scale and rotation off for the moment. That will just give me the stone at size. But if I turn scale prompt on, then every time I place the stone, it will resize the stone. Likewise, if I had a square stone and I turned rotation prompt on, every time I place the stone, it would rotate the stone or allow me to choose its rotation. We'll leave these as they are. However, before I start placing any of these, I want to make sure the copy option in the command prompt is set on. If it isn't, you will only place one. I'll show you what that looks like. So we'll just finish the command quickly. Probably not what you want. So I'm going to try that again, setting my base point and my reference point and my surface to orientate on. And we'll go for just leaving these as they are. And I'll make sure copy is set to yes. Now that that's in play, I can place the object. And as long as the blue line doesn't enter into the stone, I'm not too close. So this becomes a way of protecting my positioning of stones. And I get the same effect with positioning. So this allows me to place pave just using Rhino. So it's really kind of that simple. Now the problem with this command, orient on surface, is there's no undo. If I make a mistake, oops, I just have to keep going and just delete it later. Because if I try and stop this command early or undo early, then I'll lose every, every single stone and cutter I've placed already. So press enter to finish just like before. And now I could run it again if I wanted to. Or I could find the offending piece I didn't want to actually include and just get rid of it. Now, because everything's on a separate layer, I can actually turn them on or off freely. Or I could do my booleans freely as well. So I could do a boolean difference to cut out the surfaces. Just select all the cutters. And there we are. So if I turn off my stones, all the cutters are in place. Now, this also leaves the issue of how to actually get the claws in place. And I'll do something very similar for that. What I would actually do is I would make myself a claw. Now, I could make it the center of the universe here, or I can make it anywhere else. This is a simple cylinder. I'll maybe set the diameter to 0.5 or even 0.6. It's a standard pave claw size. And I'll give it some height, maybe about a mil. But then I'll move it down. So if I were to put it next to the stone here, it would be about the height of the stone. The reason why is because I would seldom cast these claws directly on the surface of an object. Uh, it's uh, very, very hard to clean them up, and they're not going to be as strong as if we actually raised them with traditional pave setting. So as long as that's the right height, we're fine. And now I'll round out the tip top of it with the fillet edge command, variable radius fillet. I don't need much. Since the claw is only 0.5 millimeters diameter, this has got to be smaller than 0.5, or even actually smaller than half of that, like 0.25. So I'll make it 0.2. And that gives me just enough roundness to make it look believable. And I'm going to put this on its own layer, actually. I should have done that before. Put it on purple. Change object layer. And now that claw is ready to set. I'll do the same sequence. Orient on surface. Select the claw to orient, base point at the center, reference point on the side, and then I'm going to go back to the same exact surface as I did before. And I'll leave the settings as they are as well. And all I need to do now is just get the claws in position to where it looks believable. Now, it looks like my claws need to be a little bit bigger, so I might actually go back and scale them before I apply this, but the principle is there, and this would work just fine for the same effect. You could, if you wanted to, use a scale prompt to actually solve this problem. This is what it would look like if I used scale instead. I'll turn this on, or I'll select it rather, and then I'll turn on orient on surface again, base point and reference point again. Same orientation surface. I'll turn on the scale prompt. That's okay. Copy still on. Now every time I place one of these claws, it's a shared claw, 
It's going to ask me how big I want to make that shared claw. If it's jumping around too much, just simply turn off your grid step. It doesn't matter at this point anymore. And I can just set the claws according to my taste. And once you're happy with that, since all these claws are for show anyway, this will be enough to actually give us a fairly convincing looking piece of pave for the purposes of rendering. And if we did want to take this for manufacturing, we could either include the back holes or we could just leave them off. But that's how we would go about substituting the gem on surface in uh, Rhino. For more information on GemVision Matrix or Rhino courses here at Holtz Academy, visit HoltzAcademy.com.